Good morning, everyone. Good to have you today. Beautiful day, isn't it? Um, we're good to be uh, good to be back. Uh, I took Joy to Kona last week, and so we were uh, missing. We had a great time there, uh, just like the weather was yesterday here. Um, it was just gorgeous. So it was uh, a lot of fun. Hey, a couple things. Uh, we have a blood drive on April 13th, and if you'd like to give uh, blood, we'd like you to sign up back there somewhere, right? and uh, sign up to, to help with that. Inside your program today should be an Easter card, pull it out. Uh, Easter is coming up April 21st, so three weeks from today. Uh, this is a great opportunity to invite somebody to church with you. Um, probably the best Sunday of the year. 90% of people say that, uh, that don't go to church, say they would go to church on Easter if somebody invited them. So. Uh, I think the chances are pretty good, so uh, we want you to think of people that you could invite and, and bring them uh, with you. Uh, that Friday, Good Friday, we're having Stations of the Cross here, 5.30 to 8 p.m., uh, where you can just come anytime during that period and, and go through uh, with your family, with a friend, you have these stations, and you contemplate uh, the death of Christ uh, for you, and it uh, starts all the way from creation. Uh, inside your program should be a communication card. We'd like you to fill this out, drop it in the offering. We'll take it at the end of the service. This is, uh, we like to know that you're here. And if so if you do that, uh, give us a prayer request. Uh, um, and uh, we'd like you to help in kids space on the back. So uh, if you could help on Easter. Easter is kind of an interesting Sunday. You know, everybody tries to bring friends and family and so it's hard to work in kids space when you're bringing guests, make sense? Uh, but we'd like you to consider uh, doing a two hour deal on Easter and maybe uh, bringing your friends one hour and working back there another hour. So if you're willing to do that, uh, that's how you could help us with, with uh, this. And so let us know you'd like to help with that. Mark Hass, come on up here. Mark's one of our senators. Works down in Salem and has a job up here as well, so he's kind of a busy boy. He's going to lead us in prayer. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, we thank you for blessing us with this beautiful church and for placing us together at this place and this hour to worship in your name. Too often we forget about our simple blessings. The brilliant colors of a bright sunrise, the playfulness of puppies, the renewal of spring, your artwork and the ever-changing clouds in Oregon skies. Too often the business of worldly affairs takes us further from you. Sometimes it's stress from our jobs. Sometimes it's stress from damaged relationships. Cell phones won't work. Cars won't start. And during these times of stress, we don't always become the people we should be. We succumb to the temptation to worry too much. We know better, but some days the challenges outweigh the truths we know. Our trust in you fades, giving fear and concerns the power to discourage us. Stress causes distress. Stress depresses success. Stress success is a stress mess. So we ask you, Lord, to grant us peace and to calm our hearts in these bouts of apprehension and anxiety. We ask for strength and clarity. Help us to reestablish our purpose and to walk the path you've laid out for us. Dear God, we thank you that you see us right where we are and you've taught us to be still. You give us the tools and the spiritual blessing to fight against those things that try to steal our peace. We thank you for reminding us that when we're stressed and the burdens are weighing us down, we can come to you. Lord, this week marked the fourth year of fighting, famine, and disaster for millions of innocent people in the country of Yemen. We ask for your intervention to feed them, cure those who suffer from cholera, and most of all, bring peace to this extremely violent part of the world. We pray for blessings on Micah Page today. He is your faithful servant and a friend to all of us here. We ask that you work through him to deliver your word to our hearts. We take this time to acknowledge you are the creator and maker of all things, and we derive all of our strength from you. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Mark. All right, would you stand, stretch your legs a little, say hello to the people around you, and then we'll, we're going to sing some more songs together. Well, once again, good morning. 
if you don't know me yet, my name is Mike. I'm the worship pastor here. And today I get to do double duty. So, uh, we are still in our series, uh, Man After God's Heart. And that's referring to David. And uh, the question is, how is David still considered man's after God's own heart when he sinned and stumbled so greatly and has such trouble in his family? Uh, and this passage we're going to look at today uh, in 2 Samuel 15 uh, really highlights why David is given that uh, that title. So, if you want to open, I encourage you to open your Bibles. Uh, if you don't have one with you, there's one under the seat in front of you. Uh, and on that Bible, it's page 315. And we'll get there in a little bit after we uh, get a little bit of context. So, um, first off, before we look at it, I want uh, to say in the book of Samuel, David is the main character. But that's, that's only partially true, really. Uh, if you look at how and who is acting, God is the main character, right? And then that's really the story of Scripture. Um, God, is, all of human history, really, is God's story of redemption. Um, but the author brings David in as the main character, and in this chapter especially, in the chapters that follow, he contrasts the faith of David and the devotion of David to God with the uh, the revolt, the, the sin, and the waywardness of the men around him. And there's very clear parallels. Um, if you look at the, the book as a whole, um, between those that are going away, resisting God, and those that are following God. Uh, it's important, I think, to think about these characters. Um, David is the main character, but there's also supporting characters that come out, some characters that support David, but then also uh, lesser characters that are against David. Um, and uh, I don't know if this describes you at all, but sometimes I, I come to Scripture and it's very easy for me to just relate to the main character. And you kind of, I don't know if it's because of American entertainment or, or what it is, the American mindset maybe, I think makes it a little easier to do this, but we see ourselves as the main character and we relate to that main guy and we think, yeah, let's be like David or let's be like uh, Mary or whoever it is. Maybe you've, maybe you've thought that before. Uh, I know I have. Um, but the thing is, not everybody can be the main character. And as we already figured out and I already said, really God's the main character. So we're all actually playing a supportive role and we don't know how God is going to use us. Uh, there are several people that come into this chapter that are only mentioned in this event of Absalom trying to overthrow David. And their legacies are all remembered and cemented through what they did, how they either supported or went against David. Uh, and since David is the king of, a, of Israel and God is technically the king of Israel, they just, as there's this human vassal that's a king, um, to support David as the king is to support God and be for God's kingdom, and to resist David is to be resisting God himself. And I think we can take some application from the examples in there, realizing God may be bringing, maybe using us in small ways um, in someone else's story that really does a great work and does a great, really defines our life. Um, so if you are like me and that you tend to think of yourself often as the main character, it's very easy to do with how our, our media and our, our culture works, um, try to see how maybe God is leading you in your life to play a supporting role that accomplishes a great work for God and his kingdom. Well, however you view it, we're going to get some good uh, pieces in here in this passage. So for context... Last week we talked about Absalom, and this was the story of him inviting his brothers to sheep shearing under false pretenses. His plan was to murder his brother Amnon, and he did so, and then he fled to Gesher. That's where we left Absalom. So Gesher is, uh, well, first off, I thought this was interesting. A uh, forensic team actually made a recreation of what Absalom likely looked like. Uh, scripture tells us that he was perfect uh, in his looks, and from top to bottom, he was like the epitome of good looks. And, uh, <laughs> but it also says that when he cut his hair, there was five pounds left over, so I edited it to be more accurate. There we go. 
Okay, so now that I've ruined the picture of Absalom for you, let's, let's get forward into the actual story. Uh, okay, so Absalom has been in exile, hiding in Gesher for three years. Gesher is a non-Israelite town, so it's a uh, pagan, it's a Canaanite town, about 100 miles north, a multiple day journey. And why did he choose Gesher? Well, Talmai is the king there, and if you go back to 2 Samuel 3.3, 3, you'll see that Talmai was the father of Maka, which was David's second wife. So, Absalom is the son of Maka, and so Talmai is Absalom's grandfather. So, his grandfather is in a Canaanite town. He's a king in a Canaanite town, so he runs to him. Seems like a safe place to go. By fleeing there, Absalom would not likely pay the penalty for his sin. Uh, taking another man's life, uh, your life was forfeit. So death was the penalty if you took someone else's life. So he, he fled. He did not run into uh, the community taking his life in return. So he saved his life in that way. But also when he fled Israel... If you remember, he fled the presence of God. God had revealed himself to Israel. He was watching over Israel. He was the God of Israel. And fleeing meant that he was fleeing the presence of God. He was fleeing the worship of God. And importantly, outside of God's presence, you do not find truth. You definitely don't find grace or forgiveness. And Absalom was definitely a man who needed grace and forgiveness for what he had done. His father, who had committed a similar crime had found grace and forgiveness, though there were still consequences. Absalom may have still paid with his life, but at least he could have sought the forgiveness of God. But it shows Absalom wasn't really interested in God's grace or his truth. He wasn't really interested in God. There's a hint in that when he killed somebody. I, I, I give that to you. But he cements it. He's, he's running away. He's fleeing from God. Uh, so Absalom's sin was premeditated. Had others carry it out, he has guys that work for him actually kill Amnon, kind of cowardly. But David's sin was the same way. It was premeditated. He had others carry it out. And even though there were consequences, like I said, God forgave David. Outside of God's presence, not only do you not find truth, grace, and forgiveness, you will find uh, other terrible things. Idolatry and the resistance to God's kingdom. So, undoubtedly, in my mind, that's what he found in his grandpa, King of Gesher, who probably saw in Absalom a way to uh, overthrow David and build up his own power. I don't know. I could see how that, uh, that thought would come into their heads, uh, but that's a little bit of conjecture. So, three years he stays in Gesher, and then Joab actually uh, gets David to bring back Absalom. So, Absalom finally comes back to Jerusalem, but he stays two years in the city without ever seeing his, his dad's face, seeing the king. And then finally, through weird manipulation, and if you want to know the, the, the twistedness of, uh, of Absalom's character again, read chapter 14, he finally gets it to where uh, he can come before the king. And the king kisses him, so it seems like the murder five years ago is like brushed over. So the passivity that uh, Pastor Chris talked about last week, it continues with Absalom. So here we get to 2 Samuel 15. Absalom is not right with David, it's obvious, but uh, it'll become more obvious as we read. So let's read 2 Samuel 15. Before I actually read from God's word, though, let me pray so he would open up our eyes and our hearts. Lord, thank you for this day, and uh, again, we, we thank you uh, so many times during the service, and it's right that we should thank you. Uh, you have given us so much, and uh, this word that we are about to read and try to discern and try to understand and apply to our lives is one of those great blessings that you have given us. Uh, your very words that will lead to life and lead to uh, your truth, your grace, and your forgiveness. So I pray, Lord, you would open our hearts and our eyes to see and understand uh, that we might be changed and we might bring this good news to others and perpetuate the forgiveness and grace that we have been given. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Second Samuel 15. In the course of time, Absalom provided himself with a chariot and horses and with 50 men to run ahead of him, kind of a princely entourage, the uh, heir apparent to the throne. He would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. Whenever anyone came with a complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, Absalom would call out to him, What town are you from? 
He would answer, your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, look, your claims are valid and proper, but there is no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, if only I were appointed judge in the land, then everyone who has a complaint or case could come to me and I would see that they receive justice. Also, whenever anyone approached him to bow down before him, Absalom would reach out his hand, take hold of him, and kiss him. Absalom behaved this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice. So he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. He's not some aloof royal guy that's untouchable. He's down amidst the people. He knows their problems, and he, he, he feels sorry for them. Um, that term stole the hearts of the people. In Hebrew, it's used more of a deception versus actually stole their affections like we would read it. So it says, while he was out there, he was deceiving the people. Verse seven, at the end of four years, four years this went on. You have to wonder, did David know? Did David not care? What is going on? A lot of questions. End of four years, Absalom said to the king, David, let me go to Hebron and fulfill a vow I made to the Lord. While your servant was living at Geshur and Aram, I made this vow. If the Lord takes me back to Jerusalem, I will worship the Lord in Hebron. This probably is welcome news to David, thinking maybe he's having a turn of heart towards God, showing some kind of religious conviction. But alas, it is just a trick to get his uh, okay and uh, keep him from being uh, alerted to what Absalom's real uh, intentions are. The king said, verse 9, go in peace. So he went to Hebron. Then Absalom sent secret messengers throughout the tribes of Israel to say, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpets, then you say, Absalom is king in Hebron. Two hundred men from Jerusalem had accompanied Absalom. They had been invited as guests and went quite innocently, knowing nothing about the matter. He takes these two hundred people, nobility, probably friends of the court, to show maybe this is an official thing. David sent them and, and is uh, handing off his, his kingly duties early, maybe. Uh, add a, a sense of uh, officialness to it. Uh, while Absalom was offering sacrifices, he also sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor, to come from Gilo, his hometown. And so the conspiracy gained strength, and Absalom's following kept on increasing. So, Hebron, uh, if I remember right, it's about 10 miles south of Jerusalem. It's not very far. And Gilo, which is where Ahithophel lived, is near Hebron. So, David, Absalom went to Hebron because David was declared king first in Hebron when he was king of Judah and then later went to Jerusalem when he was king over all of Israel. So a fitting place to declare himself as king. But then also because Ahithophel, his co-conspirator we find, uh, was living near there. So Ahithophel, who is this person? This is one of these supporting characters that comes up who, this is the first time you read about him in scripture. Um, and he was a renowned advisor. 2 Samuel 16, 23 says, Now in those days the counsel that Ahithophel gave was as if one consulted the word of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel esteemed, both by David and by Absalom. A wise, great counselor who has decided to join a resurrection against David. There's got to be a backstory, right? Why would this wise, renowned counselor who has served David want to suddenly overthrow him? And this is where reading through the rest of the book and piecing names and things together uh, builds for us this backstory. So, first off, Ahithophel, we find in 2 Samuel 23, 34, was the father of one of the mighty men, Eliam. And Eliam, that's all it says in that passage. If you go back to 2 Samuel eleven three, 3, Eliam is the father of, dun, 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 Bathsheba. So, Ahithophel is Bathsheba's grandfather. Picture starts to clear up, right? Ahithophel suddenly has a long list of grievances against King David. David brought shame upon Ahithophel's family by how he treated Bathsheba and Uriah, right? Israel is much, was much more of a shame-based culture than we are. It's easy for us to gloss over all the mentions of shame and disgrace in the Bible, but there are a lot. It is uh, even, uh, well, anyway, it's in there a lot. Uh, so David brought shame upon Ahithophel's family. He murdered his grandson-in-law, Uriah. He dishonored his granddaughter, Bathsheba. And the affair produced a son, a, his great-grandson, which died because of the actions of David. So I personally can see why Ahithophel would hold a bitter grudge against David. 
Unfortunately for Ahithophel, overthrowing a king in Israel is different than overthrowing any other tyrant or despot uh, from another country. Because as we already said, God is really the king of Israel. And David is his anointed king. So, revolting against David means you're revolting against God. And neither of them take that to heart, or neither of them cared, Ahithophel or Absalom. Other characters that are against David in uh, the chapters that come, Shimei, this guy that follows David as he's leaving Jerusalem, and he hurls, hurls curses at David when he's at rock bottom, and he glories in David's uh, dishonor um, because... Uh, Shimei is angry that David took the throne, he says, from Saul. And then there's Ziba, uh, in the first part of chapter 16. Appears to be a supporter of David, brings gifts, uh, but he spreads false, false rumors about Mephibosheth, a, a false report. Um, doesn't actually offer to go with David. It seems that he's just playing both sides safely in the middle and seeking profit, seeking to line his own pockets. But there are many, uh, characters that are supporting David that are contrasted with these others, and we'll get to those when we read the next section. So let's continue reading, and we'll get a little bit of the good news. Chapter 13, uh, sorry, 15, verse 13. A messenger came and told David, the hearts of the people of Israel are with Absalom. Then David said to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, come, we must flee, or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately, or he will move quickly and overtake us and bring ruin on us and put the city to the sword. David had to move his whole household out of the castle. There were young people, there were a lot of people to move. They were move, going to move slowly. Hebron wasn't very far away, so if, he was, if Absalom was bent on catching David right away, he could have easily caught him and uh, put him to slaughter. Verse 15, the king's officials answered him, Your servants are ready to do whatever our lord the king chooses. The king set out with his entire household following him. But he left ten concubines to take care of the palace. So the king set out with all the people following him, and they halted at the edge of the city. All his men marched past him, along with all the Carathites and Pelathites, and all the six hundred Gittites who had accompanied him from Gath marched before the king. So the Gittites from Gath, when David was in the Philistine country, they came back with him. The king said to Ittai, the leader of the Gittites, Why should you come along with us? Go back and stay with King Absalom. You are a foreigner in exile from your homeland. You came only yesterday, and today shall I make you wander about with us when I do not know where I am going? Go back and take your people with you. May the Lord show you kindness and faithfulness. But Ittai replied to the king, As surely as the Lord lives, talking about God, and as my lord the king lives, wherever my lord and king may be, whether it means life or death, there will your servant be. How amazing that this foreigner or this uh, Philistine shows more loyalty to David than his own son and his trusted advisor. Contrast, those who are seeking God's kingdom versus seeking their own. Verse 22, David said to Ittai, go ahead, march on. So Ittai the Gittite marched on with all his men and the families that were with him. David is at a super low point, right? Inches from despair if he's not there already. But yet, God brings these messengers of hope along with him that help remind him that God is with him. 23, the whole countryside wept aloud as all the people passed by. The king also crossed the Kidron Valley, and all the people moved on toward the wilderness. Zadok was there too, and all the Levites who were with him were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. They set down the Ark of God, and Abiathar offered sacrifices until all the people had finished leaving the city. So, priests and Levites say, the Ark belongs with you. You're God's anointed. Uh, show of support. But King David said to Zadok, take the Ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and let me see it in his dwelling place again. But if he says, I am not pleased with you, then I am ready. Let him do to me whatever seems good to him. This attitude of David is commendable. It's, it's amazing, actually. The ark is not going to keep me safe. For one thing, that didn't work when they tried it back at the beginning of the book of Samuel. They took it into battle, and it got captured. All right, so it's not a good luck charm. It's not a protective charm in that way. David knows that. David has his hope in God himself. If the, let's take his actual words, if I find favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and let me see it in his dwelling place again. But if he says, I'm not pleased with you, then I am ready. Let him do to me whatever seems good to him. David had, was devoted completely all the way to the core of him to God. 
Likely he was still feeling guilty from his life of sin that had led to these, and he felt like these were just punishments for his actions with Bathsheba. But still, he looks to God as his deliverer. The king also said to Zadok the priest, Do you understand? Go back to the city with my blessing. Take your son Ahimeas with you, and also Abiathar's son Jonathan. You and Abiathar return with your two sons. I will wait at the fords in the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. So Zadok and Abiathar took the ark of God back to Jerusalem and stayed there. David now has some spies, some confidants right now, uh, a way to get him news. One other provision that God gives. But David continued up the Mount of Olives in a posture of mourning. Weeping as he went, his head was covered and he was barefoot. All the people with him covered their heads too and were weeping as they went up. Now David had been told, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. Powerful, wise man who likely would mean the destruction of David with his wisdom. So David prayed, Lord, turn Ahithophel's counsel into foolishness. With Ahithophel's track record, that was, uh, that was a big prayer. And it's amazing that immediately he was told Ahithophel is with them. He turns again to God. First thing, God is my deliverer. Turn Ahithophel's counsel into foolishness. The amazing thing is God answers his prayer both immediately and long term. We'll see that in a minute. When David arrived at the summit where people used to worship God, Hushai the archite was there to meet him. His robe was torn and dust on his head. This is one of the other supporting characters that is for David. David said to him, if you go with me, you will be a burden to me. It's a nice thing to say. <laughs> but if you return to the city and say to Absalom, your majesty, I will be your servant. I was your father's servant in the past, but now I will, I will be your servant. Then you can help me by frustrating Hithophel's advice. Won't the priest Zadok and Abiathar be there with you? Tell them anything you hear in the king's palace. Their two sons, Ahimea's son of Zadok and Jonathan's son of Abiathar, are there with him. Send them to me with anything you hear. So Hushai, David's confidant, arrived at Jerusalem as Absalom was entering the city. So Hushai is, one, uh, is David's kind of personal friend counselor, one of the other counselors that he had. And he, he thinks your advice, if you go and give Absalom uh, contrary advice, uh, maybe you can uh, get Absalom to give me more time uh, and counter the advice that Hithophel gives. So, David now has a plan. He also has multiple contacts in there. He's going to get word. Uh, this is a direct answer to, to David's prayer. Look at, uh, look at, again, the timing. Verse 31, David prayed, Lord, turn Ahithophel's counsel into foolishness. He's on his way up to the top of the mountain. When David arrived at the summit, where people used to worship God, Hushai the archite was there. God answered his prayer immediately. In fact, God sent Hushai the archite up to the top of the mountain before David probably even prayed and met him there. Prayer works. We have a God who answers our prayers, who listens to our prayers, who responds to our prayers. And it's, uh, it's amazing to think how many things we let pass us by in our daily schedule. Needs, troubles, uh, and trials that we don't bring to God. And we know from Scripture, we know from our past, we know from the testimony of others that God answers prayers. So why don't we trust Him more? Amazing thing about this is God works in the way that David asks. God could have frustrated Absalom's plans any number of ways. Um, we see later, I'll read the verse in just a second, that God's plan was to frustrate Absalom's uh, revolt. It was ungodly, it was against him, like I said. It was going to be squashed. But David prayed specifically for Ahithophel's counsel to be turned into foolishness. In uh, the full story, we don't have time for it, but 2 Samuel 17, 5 through 14, the next couple of chapters, uh, Ahithophel gives this advice. Say, hey, take 12,000 men, go after David right now, catch up to him, kill him, don't kill anybody else. Everybody else will give up, only David's life will be lost. Really good plan, actually, for being wise. Uh, go after him before he can get a chance to defend himself and when he's distraught. Uh, this was good advice. But then they, since Hushai was there, they said, well, let's hear what Hushai has to say. 
And Hushai says, no, don't do it. David's a really good warrior. And if you suffer any defeat, everyone will see, oh, Absalom's not as strong as he thought, and they're, uh, the revolt uh, will start to, to wane. Uh, and basically, he's just trying to buy David time. And he succeeds. And they say, yeah, yeah, that's better advice. Uh, let's get our big army together and chase after him with full strength of Israel. And... Uh, Verse 14 of chapter 17 says, Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The counsel of Hushai the Archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. For the Lord had ordained to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel, so that the Lord might bring harm upon Absalom. The Lord was planning to stop Absalom already, but he ordained to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel because David prayed that specific prayer. I believe our prayers have an impact on how God is going to be working in our community, in our families, in our own lives, in the lives of those around us. Uh, to say otherwise is, is to, uh, to ignore, I think, the counsel of Scripture. So we need to devote ourselves to prayer. We need to see in David this heart that is seeking God as his deliverer first and foremost. The beginning and the end of his deliverance comes from God. And we, as people of, of Jesus, followers of Christ, should feel the same. Jesus had the same heart. God was his first and his last hope. And it should be the same with us. And it should be seen in our lives. People should know. Shouldn't they? Shouldn't it come out? Shouldn't it be recognizable that we are devoted to prayer? Um, I love the stories of when non-believers, people who don't put any stock in God, bring a prayer request to somebody they know is a praying church. I've been a part of several churches that, that were like that, and that's happened here. There's been stories of that. Coworkers and, and uh, even strangers uh, to, to me, but somehow a connection is there, and they knew that people here prayed, so they brought a prayer request. Uh, that is great. I wish that would happen more, right? That should be the, the standard. Let's devote ourselves to prayer. So, Absalom, Ahithophel, and Shimei all eventually pay with their lives for their revolt against God. As soon as Ahithophel's uh, good advice was uh, voted down, he knew the revolt was over. He went home, set his affairs in order, and hanged himself. So, a lot of parallels to Judas, actually. Betrayed, his friend, ended up killing himself by hanging. And that's his legacy. A man whose advice had been esteemed to be similar to the word of God because it seems he let the bitterness and anger from David's uh, bringing shame upon his family, uh, he let that control how he responded to God and uh, his whole uh, legacy was, uh, was washed away from that. Absalom pays with his life his hair, that great log of hair gets stuck in a tree and people put spears in him. End of Absalom. Shimei, he, uh, yeah, you can read the story if you want. He, he just makes a lot of silly mistakes and uh, ends up paying with his life. Had a chance to live and didn't. Ittai and Hushai are only mentioned in this story. Their support of David is how God used them to support his kingdom in this one, one episode. Uh, I'm sure God used them in other ways, but... The way they're memorialized, the way they're cemented in history is this one encounter and one event. So it makes you wonder how God's going to use our uh, somewhat, but they might be small events in our life from our perspective. It might be a sudden event. It might be a short time of our life, but it might be the biggest contribution we make to God's kingdom in our life. We don't know how God's going to use our, our thing. And what did they offer? Ittai offered support to David at his lowest, just encouragement, right? We can do that. God can, use, God can do great things with encouragement. A little bit of encouragement, turn the whole course of a life back to him. Hushai actually put his life on the line. He might have been, uh, he might have been killed for, for pretending to be uh, counselor of Absalom, uh, put his life on the line, and actually turned and saved who knows how many thousands of people and, and David, his friend, the king. So we need to, I think, and just realize that our small encounters, uh, when we play a supporting role with someone else, can have a great impact 
if we're doing it for God's glory. Uh, but secondly, looking at these characters that oppose David, I think we need to keep our sin in check. If we let our sin fester and multiply over years and years, uh, we may throw our life away in that rage and that, uh, that delusion. Uh, but as we said, David is the main character. His faith stands as a wonderful example of trusting God in the most desperate times. He valued and appreciated the friends that supported him, but he knew that God was his true deliverer. Uh, to prove this, let's turn to Psalm 3. I don't have the page number, but it actually will be on the screen, so you don't have to pay, turn. Just if you're an overachiever, you can turn in your physical Bible. Just joking. <laughs> Psalm 3, a psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. Let's read this together. It's not very long. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you, Lord, are a shield around me. My glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord. He answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. It's amazing. David talks about his journey up the mountain when he was up on the mountain, verse 4, I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. He did. He called out and prayed to God, and God answered him right there. He was, on his, he was slowly running from Absalom, and Absalom could have overtaken him at any moment. He didn't know. And he laid down and he slept because he knew that it was really God who was going to sustain him or protect him. Anything else? So I have to conclude, prayer works. David knew it. David knew that his hope started and ended with God, and it's the same for us. So, if we want to have a heart after God's heart, uh, like our Savior Christ and like David, we have to see that. God is our deliverer, and we need to not neglect prayer. It needs to be uh, the foundation of our hope each day. Yeah? Speaking of which, let's do that. Lord, we thank you for this great gift of prayer. We thank you that you are such a consistent and ever-present God who is able to do all we ask and more. We know, Lord, that our prayers to you uh, may not be answered as directly as you answered David's prayer or as uh, specifically uh, along our requests as you answered David's, but we know, Lord, that you are good, that you work all things for our good. And so however you answer our prayer, Lord, it will be good for us. You desire to bless us. You desire to work good things for us. And sometimes, yes, that means uh, that we have to uh, take a, a consequence for our sin. And part of that is to learn. Part of that is to understand your justice. Uh, there are so many things that you teach us, Lord, through that. Um, but Lord, I pray that we would be a people of prayer, devoted to prayer knowing that it is only through prayer that uh, your kingdom will be furthered through us. To abandon prayer is to abandon our trust in you as our deliverer, as our power, and as the one who can save not only ourselves, but our family, our friends, this community, uh, this city, Lord. Help us in this to be people of prayer. And we know, Lord, when we pray that you answer us, that you respond, you never do nothing in response to prayer. So we thank you in that. And we give praise to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.